Well, hello everyone, uh, and welcome to the World Affairs third program in their Elections 2020 series. Uh, until uh, uh, until democracy until Election Day, right? So we're we're uh, running up to uh, our November election. The World Affairs is, uh, and up until then, the World Affairs is holding a series of virtual conversations on key issues affecting our democracy, like housing, healthcare, disinformation, and the role of media along with key global policy challenges like climate change, the changing US role in the world, and our relations with China, Russia, and countries in the Middle East. We're glad to see you are all eager to learn about some of our most pressing issues at home and abroad before casting your vote this November. And so today we'll be discussing the future of US global leadership. I'm Marcos Kunalakis, the moderator for today's program, and I'm a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution and the foreign affairs columnist at the Miami Herald and at all McClatchy newspapers and sites. I'm delighted to introduce our speakers today, Rebecca Listner, assistant professor at the U.S. Naval War College, and Mira Rapp Hooper, senior fellow at the Yale Law School's China Center. Mira and Rebecca co-authored An Open World, how America Can Win the Contest for 21st Century Order, and I'm holding that book up right now. It's available at your favorite local bookstores and, of course, online. And maybe when I'm introducing you, uh, Mira and Rebecca, you can virtually sign my book here by uh, signing on the screen. Let me uh, give a brief introduction. Rebecca Listner is an assistant professor in the Strategic and Operational Research Department at the U.S. Naval War College. Previously, she was a research fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and a Brady Johnson Fellow at Yale University's International Security Studies. Mira Rapp Hooper is a senior research scholar in law at Yale Law School, as well as a senior fellow at Yale's Paul Tsai China Center. She studies and writes on US-China relations and national security issues in Asia, and uh, is uh, formerly a senior fellow with the Asia Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security, also known as CNAS, amongst the foreign policy cognoscenti, and a fellow with the CSIS Asia Program and the director of the CSIS Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative. As you can see, the uh, qualifications and the credentials are quite extensive and deep. And so I'd like to welcome you both. And we're glad you who are here with the World Affairs Organization are glad and happy to you could join us. So welcome. Thanks so much, Marcos. It's great to be with you. And thanks to the World Affairs Council for having us. Great. And Rebecca, I should also mention, as someone who's a local, uh, she was brought up in the San Francisco Bay Area and is quite familiar with both the broadcasts that we do in the Bay Area and also with the World Affairs Organization. So let me ask and start out by asking, uh, why this book? Why now? Uh, and, and whose idea was this? Rebecca, you, you, did you just sort of pick up the phone and say to Mira, you know, we need to change the grand strategy of the United States. You got a few minutes? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us here for this event, and thank you to Marcos for moderating. And our book argues that the U.S. has the opportunity to reimagine its foreign policy for a post-pandemic and potentially post-Trump world before it is too late. And we started this book in the wake of the 2016 election when Mira and I were having a series of conversations about how Donald Trump himself was more an avatar than an architect of the massive domestic and international changes that were transforming American foreign policy. Because it was clear to us that even if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, she too would have had to contend with the rise of China, with rapid technological change, and with worsening political dysfunction within the United States. And while Donald Trump's presidency has demonstrably worsened America's global standing, it's not solely responsible for the collapse of American influence overseas and the failures of international cooperation that we're seeing. So to build back better after both the coronavirus pandemic and potentially a Trump presidency, the US obviously needs a new approach, one that is both disciplined and globally engaged and sets out to defend an open world. <laughs> 
Right. And so how did it come about? You, you both recognized this and you happened to know each other through uh, some previous work and you decided, well, we're going to create this roadmap for uh, either a second Trump administration or a future Biden-Harris administration. I guess we didn't know who the, uh, who the candidate was going to be on the Democratic side when you started writing this. But, but clearly uh, something Im Im you know, uh, impelled you towards doing this. Absolutely, Marcos. Um, Rebecca and I had been friends for a long time before we began this project, um, but we were really pulled closer together by a desire to understand the forces that were transforming our worlds and would continue to act on U.S. foreign policy. That is exactly as Rebecca said, we both had this really strong hunch that all of the changes that were taking place in the wake of the 2016 election weren't attributable to Donald Trump alone. And we also had a strong sense that the United States probably wouldn't be able to recoup its former position atop the geopolitical world, even if Donald Trump left office after four years. We had a sense that there were a set of forces both within the United States and in the world more broadly that were reshaping us and our foreign policy altogether. And so we, what we really set out to do was figure out how to map those forces through a multi-year research project that would ultimately tell us more about the world that the United States would face come 2020. So that's what we set out to do in this project. Ultimately, it led to a book. And in many ways, it also led to a set of conclusions that now seem all too obvious. The fact that the international order, that is the system of rules and norms that have long governed international politics as we know it, is deeply broken. And that this had happened long before the pandemic ever seized us. And that the United States was fundamentally going to need a new approach to the world if it was to be able to secure its own security and prosperity in the wake of disasters like this one. Right. So those conditions you lay out in the book, and it's obviously for the United States to recognize that it's no longer in what was referred to as a unipolar moment in the post-Cold War period, that there is, and of course both of you are quite fluent in this, uh, a rising China uh, that is both more assertive and more prominent, both regionally and globally. And so you, you look at the multivarious factors that are uh, currently applying pressure on the existing system and order and you say, look, let's take a step back and what do we need to do? What does the United States need to do fundamentally to change its perception in some ways of itself and its role within the United States, but also recognize that that role is being changed by forces out ex external to the United States and that it, the United States needs to react to, to that. Uh, the fundamental change that you bring up, and it's in the title of your book, is, is that the United States has to move towards this openness uh, that, uh, that I'll let you describe a bit more. And, and either of you, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to respond to that. Sure, absolutely. So why don't I start off by explaining why the U.S. role in the world has changed fundamentally, and then I'll kick it over to Mira to take us through to the implications of that in terms of the openness strategy that we set out in our book. So exactly as you said, Marcos, put simply, the rise of China means that the U.S. is no longer the world's unrivaled superpower. But American foreign policy has not adapted to this new position. Over the past several decades, China has experienced meteoric economic growth. It now has the largest GDP in the world by some measures, and its military has expanded in parallel. And while China rose within a system that was dominated by the United States, it now seeks to rewrite the rules of international politics in a way that befits its own growing power and also its authoritarian preferences. So these realities have created a new condition of geopolitics that are often referred to as great power competition. The U.S. now needs to contend with a powerful rival in China that can not only compete with the U.S. militarily in Asia, but will also challenge the U.S. economically, commercially, and technologically around the world. But even so, we recognize in the book that the U.S. remains incredibly powerful. We have an unrivaled system of alliances, a dominant dollar, a strong domestic innovation base, and a still very mighty military. So the U.S. still can protect its interests and its values in a world of great power competition if it adopts the right strategy. Right. 
And I'll pick up where Rebecca has just left things, Marcos, if I may, and that is, what is the right strategy? Um, well, in our book, we're advocating for a strategy that we call openness. And an openness strategy is a new foreign policy vision that will allow the United States to defend its interests and its values, even though it is no longer the world's unrivaled superpower. This strategy recognizes that Washington can only stay safe, secure, and prosperous if the world stays open. So what does that mean? That means three key things as we see it. First, that all states should be able to make free and independent political choices without foreign interference or coercion in their domestic decision-making process or without domination by a more powerful nation like China. Second, international waterways and airspace must remain open and accessible for commercial and military traffic. That means countries like China should not be allowed to cl close off waterways like the South China Sea. And third, global cooperation should be allowed to proceed through international institutions that are governed transparently and are modernized to deal with 21st century challenges like governing the internet or cyberspace. And to realize all three of these pillars of an open world, the United States importantly does not need to dominate every area. Rather, it needs to be able to prevent other countries from doing the same while being with like-minded allies and partners to build a powerful coalition that will ultimately support this global openness. Right, so uh, Mira, if I could pick up, it, it seems that uh, what you just described of those three points, two of them are actually being pursued quite actively by the Trump administration. Certainly sovereignty in many ways can be argued to be the Trump uh, doctrine uh, that countries uh, can, do what they like and should feel free to do. In fact, they should pursue their own interests. That was the theme of his United Nations General Assembly speech. And secondarily, uh, the Trump administration seems also to be advocating for free air and water uh, flow, whether it's uh, freedom of navigation within the open seas or otherwise. But maybe on the third one, on multilateralism, we have a, gra a grave di divergence from what the Trump administration uh, uh, seeks and has pursued. It really has been an administration of bilateralism rather than multilateralism. So is this uh, analysis and this orientation towards openness in part a rebuke to the Trump administration or, is it, uh, or are you thinking about something else? So an openness strategy departs from the Trump administration's America first worldview in several fundamental ways. So first, where Donald Trump has resisted international cooperation and withdrawn from international agreements like the Paris Climate Accord, an openness strategy seeks to build a new architecture of international cooperation for the 21st century. That means working hard to reform outdated institutions like the UN Security Council or the WTO, but it also means rallying like-minded allies and partners to write new rules and build new cooperative frameworks to address modern challenges, especially in the area of emerging technologies where few global guidelines exist. Second, where Donald Trump's administration has pursued a militarized approach to American foreign policy with nearly 200,000 troops deployed overseas and frequent threats to use military force against our global adversaries, an openness strategy makes diplomacy the leading instrument of American foreign policy. And that means recognizing that the future of international competition is not going to be primarily military in nature and investing in revitalizing a State Department that can make diplomacy the center of Americans' foreign presence. And third, where the Trump administration has degraded America's capacity at home by stoking domestic divisions and in many ways bungling our response to COVID, an openness strategy recognizes the profound interconnection between America's domestic strength and its global leadership. It therefore calls for an effective nationally integrated COVID response for restoration of the integrity of American democracy and also seeks to build consensus around a reimagined vision of America's role in the world. Marcos, if I can chime in, um, I'd love to just elaborate on the terrific uh, points that Rebecca made um, to further answer your question, which is, does this really depart from 
the Trump administration's strategy um, on, on some of these key issues. You mentioned the fact that the Trump administration supports international sovereignty um, or the fact that it may be in favor of keeping the global commons open. But exactly as Rebecca has just indicated, without an approach to international order that seeks to work with allies, multilateral institutions, and agreements, it's actually nearly impossible to do those other two goals and to execute them faithfully. That is to say that in instances where China has used coercion to try to bully states in its neighborhood or elsewhere in the world, the United States has generally not aligned with them to help them stand up to Chinese pressure, but rather has preferred to use sovereignty as an excuse to disengage and pull back from the world and key international agreements. And while the United States nominally still stands for principles like freedom of navigation, in reality, it hasn't worked with allies and partners in Southeast Asia to help keep the South China Sea open. So while it may be true on paper that the Trump administration not only supports political independence or open global commons, the reality is that with power shifting against the United States, these goals can really only be accomplished if it works with allies, partners, and through multilateral institutions, because without them all, the geopolitical math does not favor us. Right. So that really is a departure from the Trump administration's approach. As I say, you know, they is a clear favoring of bilateral relations versus multilateral institutions and agreements and treaties and things of that sort. So uh, your suggestion uh, really would require a fundamental shift in the Trump administration. Let me just stop one moment and say that for those of you who are watching, you may have questions also, and I'll incorporate them or even uh, read some of the questions. To get to the Q&A button, you go to the bottom here uh, where the Q&A button is on your Zoom, uh, on your Zoom screen. And, and please, I see some already coming in, but please uh, uh, keep them coming and I'll incorporate them or even just read them verbatim. So as I say, the Trump administration uh, is unlikely to uh, change its really fundamental ideological orientation on these, on these questions. So how would you then see a second Trump administration being able to incorporate parts, or is it even possible to incorporate parts of what you're suggesting towards a global openness within the frame that they currently operate and the way that they are conducting foreign policy? So that's a great question, Marcos. And there's always been a certain schizophrenia to the Trump administration's foreign policy, which is to say that Donald Trump himself has these certain long-held beliefs and worldviews, antagonism towards allies, antagonism towards trade, antagonism towards multilateral cooperation, and even antagonism towards fellow democracies amidst an admiration for strongman autocrats. But other members of his administration see it differently. And we've seen frequent, at least rhetorical tribute being paid to the importance of America's alliances, to the importance of building new coalitions to counter China. So if the Trump administration is really serious about standing up to Beijing in a second Trump term, it ought to take the openness strategy quite seriously. It ought to, first of all, commit itself to keeping the global commons open and pursue a more effective strategy for doing so, precisely as Mira has just laid out. It ought to rethink its reluctance to participate in multilateral agreements because geopolitically, with the United States no longer in a position of unrivaled superiority, we're not going to be able to keep pace with China over the long run unless we rally like-minded allies and partners behind us in that effort. And central to that is going to be building new institutions and writing new rules for 21st century challenges. This is a charge that the Trump administration should absolutely take up. And finally, the domestic piece. Trump often speaks about America first, but unfortunately, the trajectory of the United States under his leadership has not often reflected those priorities. So if a Trump administration were serious about implementing an openness strategy in a second term, it would have to begin by mounting a truly effective response to COVID. Because for as long as the American people suffer from this grave health crisis, and for as long as many Americans lack access to good health care, it's going to hinder the United States' ability to act on the global stage. All right. Mira, do you have something to add on that? 
I'll simply note that um, if you were to sort of take the Trump administration's charge for competing with China at face value, exactly as Rebecca has suggested, that would still suggest that the administration needs to completely rethink its approach. If one were to look at Trump administration China policy over the course of the last four years, it is hard to point to a single achievement that a trade war or a highly confrontational stance towards Beijing has yielded for the United States. So while what we're suggesting here by way of multilateral approaches and approaches through allies may not seem like they fit the Trump bill, and in many ways they do not, I would think that any second term Trump administration would have to be thinking long and hard about what it means to successfully compete with China. And if they did, would likely come back to the tools and prescriptions that we're laying out here. Right. Uh, so a big part of your book in terms of any administration, whether it be a Biden-Harris administration or a Trump-Pence administ second administration, uh, really focuses on the domestic realities of the United States. That is, if we are, in, are really serious about having any type of uh, effective foreign policy, we really need to be able to both unite at home and, uh, and be able to not be as divisive as we appear to be, uh, whether it's in the streets or in our politics or even within our legislature, that, that a good part of uh, being able to have an effective foreign policy is having a strong base of support, understanding and, uh, and desire on the part of our citizenry here in the United States. In fact, this is something that uh, General James Mattis agrees with uh, dramatically as he thinks about how do we build a strong national security structure for the United States? He always begins by saying we need a, a strong base of support and unity at home. So could you elaborate a bit about that? And then I, as I see, there are lots of cues coming in, lots of questions coming in. So I'll, I'll incorporate those soon too. Wonderful. I, I'm happy to tee off on this one, Marcos, and then I'll hand it over to Rebecca. I'll say a little bit about our current domestic dysfunction and why it is hindering our foreign policy so grievously, um, and then turn to Rebecca for what we see as some of the domestic approaches to foreign policy on the way forward. Um, first, the situation that we see as besetting the United States at home right now is one in which the United States still remains powerful by many measures, but is grievously unable to marshal some of its most important capacity. That is that Washington is performing far below its capacity because of domestic dysfunction. One of the key ways in which this is manifesting itself is through deep political polarization. That is the state of affairs by which our congressional leaders, the general public, and even our media environments have sorted themselves into opposing blocks or camps with almost no overlap between them. That makes a lot of policies harder and a lot of policies, frankly, uh, much more difficult to achieve at all, but they have some particularly serious consequences when it comes to foreign policy. First, if politics is polarized, then every time the White House changes hands, so too will the substance and the process of our foreign policy, because it will be so politicized that every president will simply want to remake his predecessor's achievements. That leads to a reckless set of choices on the international stage that makes it very hard for allies or adversaries to know what we plan to do next. Second, if our politics remains this polarized, leaders will make foreign policy choices that may be dangerous, but aren't dissuaded from doing so because they know that their party will not punish them for making bad choices. And third, these domestic fissures invite more foreign inter er, interference into our elections and into our information ecosystems. Just think of the fact that we know Russian interference in the 2020 election is already ongoing. It's just to find out how much and where it occurred. But because of all of this, um, we see a U.S. foreign policy that looks increasingly volatile, is harder and harder for friends and allies to make sense of, and ultimately weakens us both at home and abroad. A great example is the fact that the Republican Party has failed to punish Russia for its intervention in the 2016 election because it does not have incentives to do so. But with that in mind, this picture of domestic dysfunction playing out, it's all the more important to think about how we'll make domestic investments at home that improve U.S. foreign policy. And I'll toss it to Rebecca to tell us about those. Thanks, Mira. So 
America's global strength really begins with its domestic strength. And the United States to implement an openness strategy abroad needs to make the kind of domestic investments that will really sustain it over the long term. So what does that mean? In the first instance, it means investing in the foundations of America's 21st century economic competitiveness through such measures as improvements to K-12 education, better physical and digital infrastructure within the U.S., and also a sound immigration policy, not to mention the need to get the coronavirus finally under control. But while all of those are necessary, they're not going to be sufficient for the United States to flourish at home and also lead abroad. So another major recommendation of our book and pillar of the openness strategy is the need for the federal government to make game-changing investments in the United States technology base at home. That means major investments in research and development and basic research. It also means that the federal government needs to resume its own responsibility for understanding how technology works after allowing its own technological expertise to atrophy over the past few decades. It needs to lower barriers to cooperation between tech talent coming in from the private sector to the public sector. And also, it needs to change the way that the US government procures commercial technologies and puts it to use on behalf of the American people. Because so much about the future of domestic governance, but also international governance, is going to hinge on states' technological power, not just their ability to innovate new technologies, but also to adopt those technologies, including for governmental use, and ultimately to export those technologies for both commercial and political gain. So all of these measures are necessary for the U.S. to actually act with a capacity that matches its still vast power. Well, let me pick up on that because uh, I'm in California and I spend a fair amount of time in and around the Silicon Valley, even worked in the Silicon Valley for a fair amount of time. And I think it's fair to say that there's a strong libertarian strain within the culture of those who are in the corporate structures of the Silicon Valley. And what you're asking is that there be not just a cooperation, but actually a collaboration between the U.S. government and these, uh, these industrial leaders, these technology innovators, and these multinational, multi-powerful, uh, uh, really in many ways, independent nation state type organizations to ask them to take on a, an active patriotic role in this, uh, in this new environment that you're advocating for. How do you foresee doing that when what we're seeing, at least from the Silicon Valley perspective, is an, an allergy towards uh, governmental structures and from the government, an adversarial relationship with those uh, organizations? Marcos, you're quite right that we think that a realignment of the tech sector and our national interest sort of defining governmental terms is absolutely critical to this approach and that it's a tall order. Um, but the basic reason that we think this should be possible is because we think it's more than just a cultural allergy between these two forces that have driven them apart. We actually think their incentives have diverged as a material matter over the course of several decades. And if we try to realign those incentives, we can at least start to move Silicon Valley and Washington a little bit closer together. Of course, for much of the Cold War, the United States invested heavily in research and development and in basic science. But after the end of the Cold War, those investments plummeted. And as a result, most of Silicon Valley has grown up in a world where it was receiving little by way of federal funding and little by way of incentive to work with the federal government on groundbreaking innovations. As a result, Silicon Valley has understandably chased market incentives, often across foreign shores, um, and perhaps becoming more willing to work with countries like China as they grew and chased market share there. Um, but ultimately, what that results in is a tech sector that is increasingly chasing interests that are not always aligned with the interests of the American government. That deprives the government itself of talent. That deprives the tech sector of the ability to work with Washington on potentially lucrative contracts. And it increasingly pushes us towards a world in which the tech sector may become regulated under heavy burdens that it ultimately opposes. 
Um, so how would we fix this? One way would be to start by raising federal R&D and basic science, reforming the procurement process by which Washington can actually work with Silicon Valley, and by creating channels between the two of them so that cutting edge technologists have reasons to work with and inside of government through things like a cyber reserve corps that uses their talent for national ends. It will take a lot to bridge this growing gap, but we think that it's more than cultural and that if we really put our heads to the question of how to realign these incentives, we'll find that there actually is far more common ground than that has been apparent in the last 10 years or so. Yeah, Rebecca. And if I could just jump in there, I just want to be clear about what the U.S. is up against in many ways in this sort of growing tech war that seems to be brewing between the United States and China because China is pioneering this new model of digital authoritarianism that features a nationally integrated technology strategy that is funded by lavish government invest in, investments in their own technology firms, some of which are explicitly affiliated with the Chinese state. It features civil military fusion, which is to say few barriers between commercial innovation and its adoption for national security purposes in China. And it features a vast surveillance state that has facilitated the oppression of Uyghur Muslims among many other Chinese citizens. So Silicon Valley actually can't afford to be agnostic in this global tech race. Because if China outpaces the United States, we are apt to see Chinese companies gaining more and more global market share as Chinese commercial power grows. We're likely to see China writing the rules and the standards for 21st century emerging technologies in ways that are prejudicial to American companies. And we're likely to see American companies as they try to break into foreign markets, including China, being subject to odious national regulations, whether that's forced technology transfer or human rights violations or forced censorship. So even if there are certain cultural frictions between Silicon Valley and the U.S. federal government, it ought to be pretty clear that Silicon Valley wants to be on the side of an open technological order and not on the side of a closed authoritarian friendly technological order along the lines of what China seeks. Right. Uh, let me jump to some of the other questions that are coming in here. And it really is a, a there's an orientation towards your concept of openness, uh, global openness, and, and the strategy of openness. Mark uh, Tacola asks, should we welcome illiberal regimes into a new open multilateralism or try to condition their involvement? And, and there's a related question that Trigby Perea asked, which is how do we transition to an open posture with so many global strongmen such as Putin and Xi Jinping wanting to retain and increase their power and reach, as you have just pointed out, Rebecca. This is a terrific question. Um, and we'll thank both questioners for, for really zeroing in on a critical uh, decision note that that is before the United States and its partners. What the openness strategy acknowledges is that we're going to have to live in a world that it includes unsavory autocratic strongmen like Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin for a long time. That particularly when it comes to China, the United States does not have the ability to change the character of this regime, nor does it have the ability to change China's overall strength. Um, but what it does call for is for all of international politics to be governed by open principles, regardless of the state's regime type. That is to say that if China and Russia want to play ball and want membership in new international institutions along the lines of the ones that we're suggesting, let's say to govern cyberspace or the internet, they will have to agree to governance that is transparent and open. That is, even if they're not demo dem democracies themselves, they'll have to be governed by open principles on the international stage. Now, that's important because it means that we're not necessarily going to exclude Russia or China, but it means that we're not gonna work with them if they are not willing to work by these transparent principles. If they're not, we're resigned to working with coalitions of like-minded allies and partners who share our preferences for open norms. And by making those choices and potentially leaving Moscow and Beijing out of the equation over time, we hope that they and perhaps other autocracies will gradually be incentivized to reform and adopt some norms that do ultimately lean in the direction of openness. Rebecca, to that, I would just add that there are some foreign policy analysts who are advocating what is called a free world strategy, the idea that the U.S. should lash up with other democracies and 
sort of wage a form of ideological warfare that puts liberalism versus a liberalism. And while an openness strategy is certainly not agnostic about the preferability of living in a world with lots of other democracies and cooperating with other democracies as a focal point for our strategy, it also recognizes that there are some countries that are not democracies that may nevertheless be good partners for the United States as we seek to compete with China in this new age. So there you might think about a country like Vietnam, which is itself a single party state, but shares some really important interests with the United States in wanting to keep the South China Seas open. Similarly, there are some democratic states like rising India that is itself a democracy but does not have identical preferences and interests to the United States. While it shares some of our interests, for example, in keeping the Indian Ocean region open and pushing back against China's uh, encroachment therein, India also has propagated longstanding uh, internet shutdowns, for example, in Kashmir, in a way that aligns it much more with a Chinese-led idea of cyber sovereignty that could lead to a global splinter net. So to put these sort of regime type blinders on our strategy to say we're only going to work with democracies or we're not going to work with any non-democratic regimes is actually to limit the options available to American strategists as we try to keep the world open. And openness very intentionally is not the same as democracy or liberalism. Openness is a different idea that actually can bring a broader coalition along with it. In some ways, it sounds very similar to what Jean Kirkpatrick used to say. And I mean, divis you know, her divisions were totalitarian versus authoritarian regimes and dealing with one and not the other, but not, but not uh, precluding any relationships with those regimes that we didn't have full ideological alignment with, as long as there was some willingness to work with the United States. Is, is there anything that parallels here? Or is this just me? sort of falling back on, a, on an old uh, uh, framework? Well, I think we probably would hesitate to echo a framework that was developed for the Cold War because we do see the dynamics um, astride the global stage now is fundamentally different from that. Whereas um, the US and the Soviet Union were locked in something on the order of a bipolar conflict, that is a competition that sorted the world into two blocks. We see competition between the United States and China actually being much messier than that. Um, while there is competition between these two countries, it's taking place in a world that fundamentally has multiple power centers um, and where power is shifting with every passing year. Um, so the key thing, Marcos, that I think you've got right here is the fact that we are uh, not resigning ourselves to discard any potential partner so long as they are willing to work by the principles of openness on the international stage. And while we don't hold out high hopes for changing the nature of the Communist Party in China anytime soon, we do believe that transparent international governance can have positive effects the world over and may ultimately help to shape actor preferences over time. And if I could just add, an openness strategy is clear-eyed about the fact that there are certain borderless global challenges that even the U.S. together with allies and partners cannot solve on our own. And here we could think about climate change or even global pandemics and nuclear proliferation as being emblematic of a category of challenges that really do require cooperation at minimum between the U.S. and China in order to solve. So while an openness strategy is not prepared to trade away the core principles of openness in service of this type of international cooperation, it does recognize the necessity of this type of great power cooperation on a certain category of challenges and actively seeks to work with China as mutual interests do dictate. Right. So to that point, uh, and in particular regarding uh, nuclear nonproliferation and the like, we have a question from James Larimore, who really just says, what about nuclear weapons? Clearly during the Cold War, it was uh, in some ways an easier task to deal with when you didn't have non-state actors trying to achieve, uh, or even state actors that weren't active in the nuclear frame able to uh, achieve competence within developing, uh, new, I mean, new, North Korea is a new player in this game. How do you then recommend in an open environment uh, dealing with nuclear powers and rising nuclear powers? 
Well, nuclear weapons, in a strange way, um, sort of complicate some of our current geopolitical dynamics, because while we would generally see the United States and China as the two leading powers in the world, China is a nuclear power, but has an arsenal that is far smaller than that of the United States, whereas the other major nuclear power is Russia, who, by most other metrics, is actually a power on the decline. If you look at Russia's economy, its demographics, its dependence on hydrocarbon prices, Prices, it really um, is hard pressed to make a bid for the fact that it is still a great power, if not for its military and in particular its nuclear weapons capabilities. So nuclear weapons sort of obscure the fact that Russia is very much a power on the decline. Nevertheless, we of course also have to consider newer nuclear powers like North Korea. And their openness really seeks to contain the worst of the reach of these new nuclear powers. That is, openness suggests that we should be working energetically with allies and, frankly, non-allies like China to try to make sure that North Korea does not use its nuclear weapons um, through deterrence and defense, does not proliferate them, and ultimately is pushed towards arms control so that it is willing to place limits on the numbers of weapons and delivery systems that it has. So openness ultimately acknowledges that the world's most powerful and dangerous weapons can still upset calculations, change the way that we think about power, and ultimately that nuclear nonproliferation has to be approached as a coalition activity. Right. Well, uh, Robert Winter says, I sure hope some of Biden's folks are listening. Elements for Biden's comebacks in next week's debate is how he frames it. Are there things that you would uh, whisper into Joe Biden's ear? Uh, as he prepares for this debate and, and contrasts that he can plan for uh, I, uh, that you've laid out in the book? Well, I certainly wouldn't presume to be an expert in that kind of debate, especially against such an unusual opponent as Donald Trump. But I do think that this book lays out a number of contrasts that Biden himself can draw between the vision of America's global role, but also its domestic strength that uh, is in really sharp contrast to what Donald Trump has put forth. And there, I would uh, evoke a phrase that we use in our book, but that has also incidentally become a slogan of the Biden campaign, which is build back better. And the United States at this moment confronts what is probably the greatest geopolitical crossroads that it has faced since 1991, if not since 1945 with the end of World War II. And there lies a tremendous moment of opportunity. But that window of opportunity is fleeting and it's also closing. So if I were Joe Biden, I would make the case that the United States needs to reimagine its foreign policy for a post-pandemic and, in his view, post-Trump world before it is too late that it needs to seize upon this moment of historic wreckage, both at home and abroad, by building back better, by investing in the American economy and in the American democracy in many of the ways that we've already discussed, but also seizing upon this moment of opportunity to really lead internationally, to build these new forms of international cooperation, to revitalize our alliances, to rebalance our foreign policy away from an over-reliance on military force and towards a greater use of diplomacy. Because the fact is that this opportunity is not going to come again. And the stakes in November are exceptionally high. Because if the U.S. doesn't act soon to take up this mantle of global leadership, nobody else will. And we're likely to see an international trading system that increasingly buckles under unfair market practices to which the trade wars have not actually been fundamentally helpful or responsive. We're likely to see a global internet that splinters into nationalized information systems, a process that in many ways the Trump administration is abetting through measures like the ban on TikTok. And we're likely to see growing global disorder because COVID has shown that if the U.S. doesn't lead on the international stage, nobody else can. And the pandemic that we are in the process of witnessing right now could prove a mild harbinger of much worse disorder to come. So well, if I were Joe Biden, I would make that case to the American people and to tell them that this opportunity quite simply won't come again. Right. I think it's interesting, and maybe, Mary, you can comment as well. What you're saying, and, and it's, I think, maybe surprising to some, is that you're saying this is a moment of opportunity, that, in fact, the Trump administration has shaken certain things up and, and really realigned and, and rejiggered the entire system, uh, allowing for any person coming into the White House at this point to start 
almost from ground zero uh, because so many of the alliances have been questioned, so many of the relationships and treaties have been renegotiated or just torn up. Um, I, think it's, I think it's surprising perhaps that we look at this uh, end, if it is the end of uh, the Trump era, uh, as a moment of opportunity. Uh, Mira, is that really how you see it? Well, you know, I would just note, Marcos, that as, as we lay out and have done so today, we actually see a lot of these forces of destruction as having predated Trump himself. So while there is no question that the president has been immensely destructive to the American role in the world, to our international institutions, to our alliances and partnerships, we think that they might have actually taken something of a bruising, even if he hadn't been in office. Um, and that now would be a moment of opportunity, no matter what. That is because of the big geopolitical shifts we've seen taking place, because of the changing role of technology, because of our domestic dysfunction, the United States was always going to need a new answer for what next. But what Trump has done and what COVID has done is amplify all of these forces and maybe accelerate them, speeding them up and making their ill effects all the more clear. So you're absolutely right that in this destruction, we do see an opportunity and an opportunity for the United States to return to the global stage and to make a new era for U.S. foreign policy that actually accounts for the world that we're facing, as opposed to try to revert to some kind of pre-2016 status quo that ultimately we cannot Right. Being in California, you know, uh, subjected to wildfires, we often think about the regeneration of forests following those wildfires. Uh, and uh, when you're in the midst of it, you certainly don't feel as if it's a potential or possibility as you're enshrouded in smoke and having difficulty breathing and watching these beautiful forests uh, go up in, in flames. Um, let me return to your openness framework and your openness to some of the uh, countries that we consider both in the national security strategy and in the national defense strategy as strategic competitors. And one of the questions is from George Steffner, who says, have we gradually way, oh, I'm sorry, let me ask, it's uh, from a person named Max. Is it more beneficial for the U.S.'s global strategy to compete or cooperate with China's growing social and economic influence, particularly in Africa and South Asia? It's a good question. Ultimately, we see the choice between openness and closure as suggesting that the United States and China are primarily going to be in competitive dynamics because of we, as we have laid out, we largely see Beijing as favoring a more closed world and the United States is favoring a more open one. But what Max has aptly touched upon is the fact that where China's power and influence does not beget closure, that is where China is not trying to dominate other countries, where it is not trying to dominate uh, the global commons or close up technological spaces, there might be some possibility of the United States and China working together. Um, Rebecca has already pointed to a few areas where that is possible, um, and that is on areas like climate change and on global pandemics and perhaps rebuilding the economy. Um, but what Max suggests is that perhaps the United States could adopt a different strategy towards China on other continents, like in Africa or Latin America. What we, what we would say to that is that if China is willing to govern its Belt and Road Initiative, that is its international infrastructure projects, which has brought it to Africa and Latin America, if it's willing to govern BRI by transparent and open principles and create institutions that allow others in and allow consistent governance for international development, then we would be willing to work with China. And indeed, we would see cooperation as being in everyone's interest. But where China continues to press its power and influence through closed measures, by pursuing development norms and projects that ultimately are inscrutable to the outside world and place coercive pressure on countries to work with China no matter whether or not it loads them with debt, we oppose those policies and we call for pushing China towards openness. Right, okay. Uh, look, it's, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, we have, the United States has uh, taken a little bit of a, a step back on development and, um, and in that, you know, we're in some cases absent on the African continent, although we still have even a military presence with Africa, you know, the African Command, AFRICOM. Um, and in many ways, the competition 
on both the African continent and in Latin America seems to be a commodity, uh, a race for commodities, whether they be rare earths or labor or any number of other things that are available in abundance in these uh, nations where the United States is somewhat absent and has been absent for these last four years. Do you propose, uh, and I know because I've read the book, that uh, perhaps the United States take a more active development role? Absolutely. The United States needs to rebalance away from a vision of American foreign policy that puts the military at the forefront. What we've seen in Africa, especially since 9-11, has been a very military forward, counterterrorism forward focus of American presence in the region, while really neglecting the diplomacy and development that's going to be necessary to compete with China over the long haul. Now, what Mira just said is really important. The idea that the US doesn't actually need to symmetrically counter Chinese influence in every instance, because there are going to be projects that China pursues in the developing world that the United States doesn't need to match dollar for dollar or project for project. But what it does need to do is try to push those projects in the direction of openness and transparency. And in the first instance, it can do that by giving countries a choice. If China is the only game in town, then countries will have to work with China on these development projects for lack of any good alternatives. But the US working together with international partners can begin to provide choices for countries, a more competitive development landscape that allows them to demand better terms if they do decide to work with China and also allows them to work with the US or with our partners if they prefer to do so. Now, it's not just about partnerships internationally, though. It's also about public-private partnerships in the US. And one of the central recommendations of the openness strategy is that Washington develop a new framework for public-private partnerships. And we've already spoken a bit about what that means in the tech space, but it's not limited to the tech space because doing things like providing loans to private sector companies who can then go out and do development projects in, on continents like Africa or in Latin America is going to be a central element of that strategy of competing with China in ways that are not primarily military in nature and do foster greater transparency, openness, and ultimately choice for recipient nations around the world. Right. Well, you know, as we look at this, and uh, we're not quite at the end of this, but I, what happens in the next four years if we don't adapt an openness strategy? In fact, what happens if we continue in a much more aggressive closed strategy? That is, a, you know, having a president who likes to deal make at the summit level, uh, who is willing to make concessions to regional actors and almost creating a, a, a a frame where um, we, uh, as the United States, concede power and almost establish uh, spheres of influence. Certainly, the United States has aggressively and articulated the, our interest in pursuing a modern-day Monroe Doctrine to say that, look, Latin America, everything in the, um, in the Americas is, our, is ours, don't mess. Uh, but we're not so worried about what happens in Hong Kong or Xinjiang uh, in China, that's really a Chinese domestic issue. Or we don't really want to interrupt uh, the potential of a Belarus-Russia uh, relationship because there is a historic uh, relationship for Russia's near abroad. Can you see uh, the potential for, in essence, a 21st century sphere of influence foreign policy versus this type of openness that you're advocating for? It's a really important question, Marcos. You're fundamentally asking what are the stakes of the future of US foreign policy? And we think they're very much along the lines of what you've laid out. That if the United States does not adopt this openness strategy, it is going to increasingly face a closed world. And that closed world could have different forms of spheres of influence. You've suggested some that are really important to keep in mind. The likelihood that China could dominate parts or all of Asia, not only expelling the US military presence, but using coercion to establish hierarchies over its neighbors. 
You've pointed to the fact that Russia could have much more of a free hand in its near abroad with former Soviet countries, even if it can't dominate them the same way that China could. But it's important to keep in mind that closure in the 21st century can come in a variety of forms, not just through military or territorial domination. It could come through economic domination and coercion. It could come through China creating a closed 5G system and a closed internet, whereby it controls the free flow of information and data for every partner who adopts that system, thereby segmenting the world into completely separate information systems. Not only is this a world where we're likely to see conflict, much more likely to break out, which could ultimately draw the United States back in at much higher cost in blood and treasure, but this is a world in which the United States would have less access to markets that are beneficial to it, less access to information and the free flow of ideas, and ultimately would find itself increasingly confined to its shores in a modern day garrison state, which is exactly what ultimately drove us into World War II. So we see in this the predicates of a very dark form of 21st century forces, if indeed the United States does not seize this opportunity to keep the world open. Rebecca, do you want to add to that? I mean, it's pretty dark. I certainly don't like the idea of a garrison state, but uh, anything to add to that? Well, I think it gets even darker than that because <laughs> <Right>. what we, <laughs> unfortunately, because what we've seen over the course of this year so far is that in the absence of the United States stepping up and saying that it wants to lead a coalition globally to tackle these borderless challenges like pandemics, no one else will. China has faltered in its attempt to lead on any kind of COVID response. It has actually taken a bullying approach that has alienated many countries and have the opposite effect. So it's very clear now, if it wasn't clear before, that if the United States doesn't pursue this openness strategy, doesn't re-engage in a global leadership role in a way that is disciplined, but also very active, then there's simply not going to be any state that is rallying the international community behind the need to address address these shared challenges. And that means that this pandemic could foretell much worse future pandemics. It means that the global climate regime will not coalesce around a clear set of responses. And it means ultimately that we're going to see a world that makes Americans less secure, less healthy, and less prosperous. So it's not just about preserving our market access. It's not just about preserving the free flow of information and goods and services, all of which are really important. It's about leading a global coalition that can address upstream those challenges that might start abroad, but they don't stay there. And the U.S. is quite simply the only country in the world that can lead in that effort. Well, thank you, Mira Rapp Hooper and Rebecca Listener. We're glad you could join us today to talk about this incredibly important issue and your new book, which I will hold up yet again, An Open World, ver available for virtual signing, perhaps. Uh, but please go to your uh, local bookstore uh, in a socially distanced and uh, safe way or order online. Please join World Affairs next week for a program on China's New Silk Road with Mary Kay Magstad and me. I'm good friends with Mary Kay. Uh, and you can RSVP at www.worldaffairs.org slash events. And have a great rest of your week. And thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Mira. And thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Great to be here.